Good morning. morning. Wonderful to see you on this Wednesday morning. I usually say bright and cheery or sunshiny, but today I'll just say Wednesday morning. It's good to see you in Bible study this morning. Let's stand, open our service with prayer. Invite the Lord's presence to be with us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege to be in your house this morning, a privilege to be able to sing songs of adoration to you, to be able to look into your word throughout this day. We count it a privilege to be able to listen to a Bible study that's going to help us on our journey through life. And I pray that you'll help each one of us as we are all participants in this service to glorify you in what we do and say. We're thankful for the privilege, again, of being here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing for our congregational singing. Mr. Bazone is going to come and lead us in our singing this morning. Good morning. I encourage you to look at uh, hymn books for number 512. The words should be up on the screen behind me. But uh, Take Time to Be Holy is the song we're singing, Spend Much Time in Secret with Jesus Alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be. Isn't that, isn't that our goal? Thy friends and thy conduct his likeness uh, shall see. Take time to be holy. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting enough. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy cause. His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be time. In joy or in sorrow, still. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul, each thought and each motive beneath his control, thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou shall be fitted for service above. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of This is your prayer.
may be seated. Powerful, powerful words in that chorus. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, make me into what you want me to be and need me to be. When we think about the words of that song, and if we sing that song with true meaning, it makes the song that they, the Barnett sing, sang last night even more powerful. Because when we're molded to what he wants, then he's able to use us to do what he wants us to accomplish. And we appreciate the words of those two songs. That's one of the reasons why we come to camp meeting. It's one of the reasons why we have camp meeting, because we need a fresh infilling of his presence and his spirit. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, let's continue to pray for those that have, we have been praying for over the last number of days, many of you weeks and months, I'm sure, some of the prayer requests, many, many physical needs, challenges that individuals are facing. One of the individuals on our list, uh, uh, Dr. Gail Green has passed away, so let's pray for her family that the Lord will touch in a special way as they're making preparations. Uh, one of her children lives far away and they're making preparations for him, if him to be here. I believe in Indiana, so let's pray that the Lord will touch them. The Moore family and many of their situations are multi-generational challenges that they're facing, but I know the Lord knows what their need is, and he's more than able to slip down into those homes and slip down into their situations and meet their need. So let's especially pray for them this morning. Continue to pray for Wanda Martin, that the Lord will touch her uh, and her physical challenges. That the Lord knows what he, she has need of, even yet this morning and he can slip down and touch her and meet her need in a special way. Many situations and concerns, physical needs, emotional needs, but spiritual needs on the prayer list that we desperately want God to work and move in their midst. And there's no better crowd than a camp meeting crowd to pray for these situations and these needs. Let's stand, if you will, again, as we take our petitions to the throne of grace. It's good to have Mr. Samuel Ortiz uh, leading us in prayer this morning. He's a junior in the ministerial department here at Hope Sound Bible College. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to your house and to pray, oh Lord, and to hear your word. Help Paul in this morning as he's preaching and reminding us of the importance of prayer. Oh Lord, we pray that you will help this camp meeting, help us in every single day, every single day, service. You've been helping us and it's been wonderful and we pray that you will continue to touch lives and to change hearts, oh Lord. We pray for those who are needing help, those who are struggling with physical needs. We pray for them, oh Lord. We also pray for those who lost loved ones recently. We pray for them. Please, Lord, be with them as they're, they're suffering. They, they need help. They need you, oh Lord. We pray for them. We pray for this camp, for all the remaining services. We pray for the Hispanic services that starts tomorrow, Lord. We pray for them too. We pray that you may, you may come and change life and, and transform people, oh Lord, to your, to your name and to, to you be all the glory, oh Lord, that all that's happening here is to you and all for you. In your name we pray, oh Lord, and ask these things. In your name we pray, amen. Behind the altar, there are boxes of Kleenexes, and I know there aren't any under the seats that you have, but we're going to take a moment to reflect on the fact that it's a sad moment right now because camp meeting is half over, and I know you'll want to reflect on that. Okay, are you finished? Hard to believe camp meeting is half over, but as we say often, the best is yet to come, even though we have enjoyed these last number of days. How many of you enjoyed missionary service yesterday? If you didn't enjoy missionary service, it's because you weren't here. That's the only reason why you wouldn't enjoy missionary day. I certainly appreciated those stories last night, and I appreciated the missionary sharing with us yesterday morning. I leaned over to my wife last night during the offering, and I said, if I had $75,000, I would give it right at the beginning, just to see what Benjamin would do with all the rest of those stories. But I don't, and I didn't, and so we heard them all. Um, but I really enjoyed One of the things that I really appreciated is we heard 
the answers to prayer as individuals answered the call and lives were impacted. But Esther Hopkins told a story about her life, how God had answered her prayer as they're making preparations to go. And I think that was important for us to hear too. Because we, the missionaries give and give and give of themselves to reach others. But it's important for us to know again, be reminded again that God is answering their needs also. I think that was a, a unique perspective that she brought to us and I appreciated that. By way of announcements, if you have purchased uh, $10 in the bookstore, you were to have received a CD from Irene Hanley's sermon from 1975 for free. And evidently those had not been duplicated yet, but now they are duplicated. So sometime later this afternoon or tomorrow, you should be able to pick those up. Your name went on a list and those will be available. Definitely tomorrow, those will be available in the bookstore. So you'll want to make sure that you go back to the bookstore to pick up your free CD of Irene Hanley's message. Also at 1035, so at the conclusion of this service, you won't want to go anywhere or at least very far away. At 1035, the junior high choir is going to sing for us, Hope Sound Christian Academy Junior High Choir. So you won't want to miss uh, that this afternoon or this morning. This afternoon, the lecture series begins uh, in the student center, the Addison Student Center. There are two lecturers this afternoon. One is Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Paul Kaufman. He is going to be presenting the historical context of the beginnings of Seabreeze Community and Seabreeze Camp Meeting and what took place and why it was so important for it to start 75 years ago. And also Anne French will be speaking. You won't want to miss either one of these, but Anne French is going to be giving some little vignettes of individuals that started the camp meeting, personal stories that she has. I know that you will not want to miss either one of those. If you, I believe they're being recorded, so you can watch them later perhaps. Go back and refresh your memory because you'll be there in person. You'll want to go back and refresh your memory, I'm sure. It has been a privilege to have Paul Stetler speak to us each morning during the Bible study. We've enjoyed the material that he's presented. One of the things that I, and this, is, this comes from Paul and this just flows naturally out of him, is he ties everything that he's been speaking to us about to a song. And we may not remember everything that he says, but we do know the songs. And I'm firmly convinced that many times when we sing these songs from, from now on, his words are gonna come back to us and we will be reminded of what God can do for us even in the spirit of brokenness through broken times in our life. And I appreciate that. That's, that's a wonderful perspective that he brings to us. So let's listen as Paul speaks to us this morning for what the Lord would have for us today. Well, good morning. I didn't know if the rain would dampen our attendance this morning or not, but you have braved it and here we are. I did have my dear friends from Virginia down here say, we could have gotten this weather at home. <laughs> but uh, the weatherman says it's going to clear up later this morning. Who knows? Um, weathermen are the only people in the universe who can be consistently wrong and retain their job. You know, I don't know. Anyhow, we'll see what happens, but hopefully, actually, we locals are grateful for the rain because my yard has been brown. It's, we've kind of been in a drought, and so we're, we're happy for the rain, but I do wish for the sake of you northerners that uh, the characteristic sunshine state would, uh, would share the liquid, or stop sharing the liquid sunshine and give us more of the golden sunshine. So we'll see what happens. I have thoroughly appreciated the faithful attendance, and not only do we have an excellent crowd here this morning as we have throughout the camp, but uh, we've had a, a strong presence online, a very strong presence online. I haven't asked for numbers, but I have gotten lots of messages from people who are watching online. And so that's been very encouraging. And there are those who can't watch in this time slot, but they watch later in the day. And so uh, I'm appreciative of that. I'm also intimidated by that because we never know who's watching and what their needs are and what their perspectives are. So I just covet your prayers once again. And thank you to all of you who have prayed for me. We took a break yesterday because of Missions Day, and that's a wonderful thing. And I hope you enjoyed Missions Day but uh, since we're kind of relaunching here, I'm going to give you a brief review over what we have covered so far. Now, I was talking to Dr. Kaufman on the phone yesterday, and he said, 
at the pace you're going, it seems that you'll be finished at about Passover. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I said there's enough material I could go on for the rest of the year, let alone Passover. But uh, anyhow, I'll give you a, a quick review just so we'll put everything in context. We talked about the Lord's Prayer, what it is and what it is not. It's a work of art, but it's not merely aesthetic. Yes, it has poetic structure, we delved into that, but it's a practical tool that Jesus handed us for the purpose of inviting us into a conversational relationship with God. And I hope if you don't take anything else away from this study, you will take away that phrase, a conversational relationship with God. That is the goal. That is what has happened throughout history. You look at the, the uh, early believers, Adam and Eve, of course, walked and talked with God in the garden face to face. You go on in history to Abraham and, and just so many fascinating characters, Moses, the patriarchs. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful story of people who had a conversational relationship with God. You talked about the fact that this prayer is not original with Jesus. Jesus compiled phraseology from other Jewish prayers, Hebrew prayers, and he condensed them. He simplified them. Jesus didn't add to the encrustments of flowery language. He simplified it, streamlined it, and gave us this prayer as a gift, an invitation. Prayer is not a performing art. It's intimate conversation with a loved one. It's a sacred grouping of words, but not just a spiritual utterance that one speaks for divine favor. The Jews prided themselves in their flowery prayers, but that's not what Jesus was after. Jesus wanted a simple tool. The early church recited the Lord's Prayer and incorporated it into their daily prayer life, uh, the Didache, which is uh, the teachings of the apostles. Uh, it's a record of the teachings of the apostles. Um, speaks, speaks to that fact that they, they prayed it regularly, uh, but not just a recitation, a, an incorporation, a, an outline, a form that they followed in their prayer life. We talked about the medieval church and how there were many who were illiterate, many recited it in Latin, not even knowing what they were saying. It was kind of viewed as an incantation or a good luck charm. And uh, then the Reformation reacted against all of that. Literacy was promoted. The letter was emphasized, sola scriptura. But very quickly, the Reformation descended into the dead recitation of creeds, and uh, the Lord's Prayer was no exception. We talked about painting with a very broad brush, evangelicalism coming along and doing away with liturgical forms, emphasizing the leadership of the Spirit. And in some cases, the, the Lord's Prayer was almost lost because there was such an aversion to read prayers or recited prayers. Uh, but we also talked about how, in my own case, even though it was not practiced in our in our regular church services, it was preserved in Christian education, and I'm thankful for that. We spent much time talking about God our Father, what it means to address God as our Father, how this was not typical in the Jewish context. It was absolutely foreign in the Greco-Roman context. The gods were viewed as antagonistic, a force to be reckoned with, a force to be placated. And tragically, that is the case among the heathen all throughout the world to this day. Um, you go to places where animism is practiced, and people live in fear of gods, live in terror of the gods that they may not even be aware of. You know, there's a god for this and a god for that, and a god just around that corner, and a god on that mountaintop over there, a god in this cave over here, and we never know what god we might be offending who is going to afflict us with some sort of punishment sickness or ill fortune, and Jesus revolutionized that. He shocked the world, so to speak, by saying, first and foremost, we address God as our Father. Such a beautiful thought. But he didn't stop there. He's not just our Father. He is our Father in heaven. And that's a beautiful thing because there are limitations to the capacity of an earthly father to meet the needs of his child. But we're speaking to a heavenly father, a heavenly father who has limitless knowledge, limitless resources. And today, we come to this phrase, hallowed 
be thy name. I was reading in, in Barclay's daily, daily study Bible. Now, I, I recommend him and I don't recommend him. Barclay can sometimes be a heretic. He, he had some very unfortunate views on certain doctrines of the faith. But Barclay is a wealth of background and historic material, historical context. And so I love to read Barclay. He also has a way with words, and sometimes he can just lift you up into the heavenlies with his words. But he told a very funny story. <clears throat> he was speaking of a pastor in his native Scotland. He was a Scottish scholar, taught at St. Andrews for many years. And he said that uh, this, this young pastor was fresh out of seminary, and he was full of vim and vigor and, and a passion for, for verbosity. And he said he would pray with the most eloquent of words and attempt to just lift his congregation into the heavenlies. But in fact, these dour, practical Scots weren't really interested in all of his verbiage. And he said one Sunday, <clears throat> he mounted the pulpit and started to launch into one of his flowery prayers. And there was a stout little old Scotswoman behind him in the choir loft. <laughs> and he said she tugged at his robe and said in that thick, heavy Scottish accent that I, I really shouldn't even attempt to imitate, she said, just call him Feather and ask him for something. <laughs> Oh my, thank the Lord, we can just talk to him as we would talk to our earthly father. Hallowed be thy name. Now most of us memorized the Lord's Prayer in the King James Version, and there is a benefit to that, and that is that we have this verbiage in common. We can quote the Lord's Prayer together because we all memorized it from the same translation. And in fact, many churches that now use modern translations still recite the Lord's Prayer in the King James. There's nothing wrong with that. I think there's something beautiful about that, the continuity of that, uh, the commonality of that, where it, it uh, transcends generations. But I also would, would say that sometimes our verbiage can get in the way because we don't speak in this way any longer. We wouldn't say, hallowed be thy name, in regular conversation. And sometimes the flowery language, actually in its day it wasn't flowery language, but today it would be considered flowery language, gets in the way and obscures the actual meaning. And when you look into this phrase, it may mean something different than what you have thought for many years. It sounds like when you say, hallowed be thy name, it sounds like you're simply acknowledging the fact that his name is holy. Now, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that his name is holy. There are many prayers that do so. And in fact, names were very, very important in the Hebrew world. Names meant something. I've often said that someday I'm going to preach a sermon, and I haven't done it yet, but someday I'm going to preach a sermon on God the name changer. Peruse the scriptures and take note of all of the places where God changed someone's name. And what did it always mean? It always meant a change in that person's character. Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Jacob became Israel. And you go right on down the line, even into the New Testament. Simon became Peter. Saul became Paul. And in every case, that name change signified a change in character, a character transformation in the life of the bearer of that name. And the new name meant a new character, a new identity. You see, the, in Hebrew culture, and it wasn't limited to Hebrew culture, even to this day, names mean something. But the Hebrews, even when a newborn child was born, they would seek, they would observe and seek for some sort of sign 
that would be an indication of that child's character and even perhaps predictive of that child's future. And then they would name them accordingly. You remember in the case of Jacob and Esau, they were twins. Esau was the one who came out first, and they said he was red and hairy. So the name Esau literally means red. But it also became an indication of his character. He was a rugged outdoorsman. Ruddy, red or ruddy. Now we, we would view, you know, we call someone a redneck. Why do we call them a redneck? Because they work outside in the sun and they get sunburned. That's the indication. But it has a, a connotation that it carries with it. That they're a hardworking person who works with their hands, manual labor, out in the sun. The same was true with Esau. He was ruddy in complexion because he was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter. And then Jacob was named because as he came out of the birth canal, his little flailing hand reached over and grabbed the heel of his twin brother. And so Jacob literally means heel grabber or deceiver. Now, what a, what a noose to hang around a child's neck to call them the heel grabber. <laughs> it was almost a superstition in those days. They felt they would receive some sign that would give an indication of their character of their future, and they would name them accordingly. Of course, there's that beautiful story of God coming down and wrestling with Jacob. And he brought him to this point where he said, what is your name. In fact, when Jesus asked him to verbalize his own name, he was asking him to confess his twisted character. This was a moment of confession. It was a moment of consecration. And finally, Jacob was willing in that wrestling match that lasted all night with what turned out to be God himself, he was willing to say, my name is Jacob. I'm the heel grabber. I'm the deceiver. I'm the manipulator. I'm the one who's trying to make my own life happen. And God acknowledged his confession. God acknowledged his consecration. And God changed his name. What does Israel mean? Israel means prince. Isn't that beautiful? God transformed Jacob and called him prince. And to this day, the nation of Israel is called by his name. I love that little verse in Hebrews chapter 11 where it describes Jacob or Israel and it says, he worshiped God leaning on his staff. Now, why is that significant? Because in that wrestling met, match, God touched his inner thigh. What was the point of that? Well, Jacob had a habit of running from his problems. He offended his brother, and he ran. He offended his uncle, and he ran. His brother's coming after him to meet him in the wilderness, and what does he do? He runs. And God wrestles him down and says, it's time to confront your character. And in the process, God touched his thigh. Jacob, there will be no more running. It's time for you to rely upon me. And God allowed his hip to be crippled from that day on. And he worshiped God leaning on his staff, depending on God, always remembering that it was not in his strength that he was trusting. He was trusting in God, and God changed his name to Israel, Prince. Names mean something. Names in the Hebrew context mean something. Names not only are an indication of a person's character, but they're an indication of a person's standing in the community. How many of you remember your dad or your mom, as you were leaving the house, going to some gathering, saying, remember who you are. Remember what your last name is. Do any of you remember your parents saying that? Yes, quite a few of you. Remember what your last name is. You know, 
my father in this past Friday's service when they were honoring his 27-year legacy as president of Hope Sound, he mentioned the fact that he told us kids, you can make me or you can break me. What did he mean? He meant that his good name as a leader, his good name in the community, his reputation was on the line and we as his children, as his offspring who shared a name with him, held in our hands a certain power to make or break that reputation. Now, are we just talking about an ego trip here? Is he just egotistical and not wanting to look bad? No, friends. When you're in a position of responsibility, when you're in a position of leadership, your name means everything. If your reputation is destroyed, your leadership is destroyed. Your moral authority is destroyed. And so a good name is important. Of course, there are proverbs about that. There are scriptures about that. A good name is a thing to be guarded. In fact, one person said it this way. They said, virtue is power, but it's power derived from moral authority. You know, I discovered this as I became more close to my in-laws, the Edwards family. In case you don't know it, the Edwards are some of the finest people on God's green earth. They just are. They're farmers. My father-in-law has been a pastor for many years, of course, for many, many years, and for multi-generations, they travel in music ministry. But one of the things that I found was so beautiful about their family is that they have a stellar name in their community. Not just in the holiness movement, but in their community of Ridgeville, Indiana, and the surrounding communities. They have a sterling reputation for being people of good character. Just humble, salt of the earth, hardworking, good people. And you know, one of the beautiful beautiful things about that is that it has helped them reach people for Christ. You know, their family has participated in the public school system, and one of the reasons is because it's a small community. It's a throwback to good old USA of days gone by, and Jacinda told me that in the school where she taught and in the school where she attended, which was the same school, she said the teachers, many of whom were professing Christians would meet in the gymnasium before school and have prayer. It's a beautiful thing. But my father-in-law and his brother Daniel had at various times served on committees in that school district, served on the school board. And if something was controversial, if, if their kids were being asked to do something that violated their conscience as a part of school activities, because they had a good name, when they would go to those school board meetings and they would very kindly and graciously express their views and ask that the board consider making a change, most of the time their voice was heard and received with respect and action was taken to make accommodation. Why? Because they had a good name. I was talking to my in-laws the other day, and my mother-in-law was saying, Jonathan's been so busy today. She said some unexpected things came up. She said, we saw one of our neighboring farmers rushing to try to get his harvest in, and he was running behind. He had had some setbacks, and his tractor had broken down. And she said, Jonathan went and got our tractor and took it over and was helping him get his harvest in. Just on the spur of the moment, he dropped what he was doing and he took his tractor over to help his neighbor. No wonder they have a good name. No wonder when Jacinda died and her funeral came right in the middle of harvest, all the farmers in the area got together and brought their combines and they knocked out that harvest lickety split. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. A community coming together, people who may or may not 
have been professing Christians, but rallying around these people who have a good name. No, this phrase, hallowed be thy name, is not a declarative sentence. Think back to high school English. A declarative sentence simply declares something. It makes a statement. No, in fact, if you study the original language here, it is in the aorist imperative. Aorist imperative. What does that mean? Well, the aorist signifies a punctiliar action. It gives it emphasis. It says this is urgent and it needs to happen now. And imperative. It's saying this is something that must be. This is something that must happen. In other words, may your name be deemed hallowed. Now that's very different than a simple acknowledgement, oh God, your name is holy. What Jesus is telling his disciples to pray is, may your name be held holy among the heathen. May your name be deemed holy around the world. That's very different, isn't it? Actually, this phrase is inextricably tied to the following phrase, which we'll consider tomorrow, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The prelude or precursor or prerequisite to the coming of Christ's kingdom and its fullness His kingdom has already been launched. It was launched when Christ came to this world. But it is unfolding as we speak, and it is yet to come to its full fruition. And we as Christians are to pray for its unfolding. We're to pray that His kingdom would come to this earth. A prerequisite for that is that God's name would be made holy in the eyes of the world. You know, I was reading one commentator who said the number one obstacle to belief in God, to faith in God, is doubts about His goodness. And you know that is so true. That is so very true. I told you day before yesterday that experiencing what I have in the last two years, going through the death of Jacinda, receiving such wonderful help from the Lord, one of the things I have found is that it has revolutionized my ability to witness to people. It's so much easier to witness to people with this backdrop of suffering and healing. Because people look at my situation And they say, that is suffering. And then I testify to them about how God has helped me come through this terrible, shattering, dark time in my life and to be healed. Now, I'm still on that journey, but God has helped me tremendously. And rather than argue with me, people listen. Now, if I was just lecturing them on why they should believe in God, why the Bible is true, spouting all the evidence for the Scriptures and that Jesus was born of a virgin and that He was the Son of God and that He rose again on the third day and that He ascended into heaven. All of those things are critically important and thank God for the apologetics that we have been the recipients of. I'm so looking forward to Josh McDowell coming and speaking to us on apologetics. I'm so looking forward to viewing those ancient biblical manuscripts as we have the inspired exhibit here beginning of next month. I can't wait. That's important stuff. But friends, we will never argue our way into converting the lost. It simply will not happen. Yes, there's a time to make the case. There's a time to give evidence. But friends, ultimately, it is our testimony that will convince unbelievers to believe. And ultimately, it is victorious faith in the midst of suffering that convinces the world that they can trust God, that God is trustworthy, that God is good. You know the old phrase, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church? Why is that? 
Is it just because people were fascinated with blood and gore and they were somehow sadistically attracted to this death cult? No, friends. Why was the blood of martyrs the seed of the church? Why was their testimony so convincing? Because they could stare death in the face, the most brutal of deaths in the face, and say, God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you remember the story of the three Hebrew children. I love their response to the king when he says, maybe you didn't understand me. I said, if you don't bow, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. So we're going to strike up the band one more time and give you one more opportunity to redeem yourself. And they said, oh, king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. <laughs> Our God has the power to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow. <laughs> oh, that's faith, friends. That's faith. And initially, it enraged the king. And he said, heat the furnace seven times hotter. Derek Johnson said, that's hotter than it ought to be. <laughs> that was proven by the fact that the soldiers that threw them in died from their exposure to the heat. And the king and the members of his court are standing up on the overlook, looking down into the fiery furnace, wanting to entertain themselves with the sizzling of these traitors. And what does the king say as he looks down into the fiery furnace? He turns to his courtiers and he says, didn't we throw three into the fiery furnace and they nod their heads in assent and he said I see four and the fourth one looks like the son of God <laughs> how did a heathen king recognize Jesus the same way that a heathen world looking on and watching you as you walk through the burning fiery furnace will recognize the stately steppings and the radiance of the son of God that comes to walk with you through that fire Oh, he doesn't, always, he doesn't always get rid of the pain. Sometimes it will scorch. Sometimes you will smell like smoke. No, they didn't. It just burned their bonds, and they walked out of there harm, unharmed. But friends, sometimes the fiery trials will burn and will scorch. You will experience pain. But oh, it's always for a divine purpose. And one of those purposes is so that you can be a witness to a world that has very serious doubts about the goodness of God. If somehow your life will testify to God's goodness, you've bridged a giant chasm between their doubts and faith. This is a critical prerequisite to the coming of God's kingdom, that His name would be holy in the eyes of the world, that the world could have confidence in the goodness of God. Friends, you'll never be able to answer all their questions. People have come to me in the midst of my situation, and God forbid, I don't want to convey to you the idea that I have been some great martyr. Friends, there are so many people that have hurt far worse than me. So I, I'm not trying to convey that at all. I'm just sharing with you out of my own personal experience. People come to me and say, how do you do it? How can you survive? How do you keep your sanity? How can you go right on preaching and singing? How can you have any sense of optimism and hope for the future? Do I launch into a lecture on the five-step program that God gave me? No. Do I launch into a lecture on how God can be good and bad things can still happen to bad people? No. What do I do? I testify to God's faithfulness. I testify to His goodness. Oh, friends, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. He can give us a testimony that will draw people to Himself. People who struggle with doubts will see our testimony and faith is contagious. Did that ever occur to you? Faith is contagious. You see, that heathen king looking down into that fiery furnace went on to pen a proclamation 
to all of the realm and say, honor the God of these Hebrews. (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar was converted and made a proclamation that all of the realm should honor the God of Daniel. King Darius, the Persian king who conquered the Babylonians, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, getting ready to be thrown into the lion's den, what did he say? He said, Daniel, do you think that perhaps your God could deliver you from the lion's den? Don't you love that? This heathen king has more faith than some of Daniel's countrymen. Faith is contagious. And when God gives you the gift of faith in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, in the midst of the lion's den, in the midst of your fiery trials, that faith will spill over onto others and help them to believe. You can make His name holy in the eyes of those around you. God is trustworthy. I may not understand everything. I may not be able to explain everything. I may not have all the answers, but I can testify to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And friends, that will draw people to His side. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. His name can be made holy through our testimony. I want to read to you a portion of Scripture from Acts. See, we have this natural progression. God is our heavenly Father, and we are to guard His reputation. We are to promote His holiness to the world. You, as the child of your Father, reflect upon your Father. You create, make or break His reputation to people around you. We are called by His name, and therefore His reputation, in a sense, is in our hands. I want to read to you a portion of Scripture from the book of Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to read several verses, and I want you to listen, not necessarily even follow along, but just listen to the words of this. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Uh, that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Now, I'm reading it to you from the New King James because I I want you to think about it differently. I don't want it to just float by you as you've already heard, always heard it, but I want you to listen and think about it differently. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, when I say the name Barnabas, you immediately start thinking about Barnabas and what you know about Barnabas and the character of Barnabas, don't you? Because names mean something. What do we know about Barnabas? We know that he was the encourager. He was the one who took young men under his wing and mentored them and then launched them out into ministry. So we automatically know of Barnabas as a man who was compassionate, a man who had vision for the kingdom, a man who poured out his life to advance the kingdom of Christ. That's his reputation. That's his name. So they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Did you catch that? He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Is it just coincidence that the description of Barnabas' character is paired with this statement that many people were added to the Lord? You see, it was Barnabas' character that God used to pave the way for the sharing of the gospel. I read on. Then Barnabas departed for for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first 
called Christians at Antioch. Now, there's, there are two things in this passage that I just read that I want to draw out. First of all, Barnabas cloaked Paul in his own good name. You see, Paul had been a persecutor of Christians. They were terrified of Paul. Paul was notorious. Paul had a reputation. Saul, that is. Saul of Tarsus. Saul had broken up families, thrown fathers and mothers into prison. Saul was responsible for the deaths of many Christians. Saul stood and held their coats and sort of oversaw the process while Stephen was martyred. So what did Barnabas do? Barnabas was one of the early believers in Saul's conversion, and God laid it on his heart. And Barnabas went to Tarsus and gathered up Saul and wrapped him in the cloak of his own good name. And Barnabas took him all throughout the area, saying, this is a man to be trusted. This is a man who is truly converted, truly changed. Of course, God had changed his name to Paul. But then furthermore, I want to draw out that phrase that says, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, this word Christian just floats by us. I'm a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Break that word down, Christian. The very name of Jesus Now, it's actually more of his office than it is his name, but still, it is an inextricable part of his name, Jesus Christ. We bear his name. We are Christians. Now, if you meet people from Scandinavia, many times their last name ends in son, Eric's son. That simply means Eric's son. And in the early days, the last name would change with each generation because you would simply add son to the first name of the father. That's kind of what this word Christian is. Christian. We are a follower of Christ. We are one of his. We're one of his children. We're supposed to share attributes, share character with him. Let me just pause and ask you this morning. What does your life do for God's reputation? What does your life say about your heavenly Father? I was told a story by a pastor friend of mine not long ago, and he went to pastor a church And if this sounds similar to some church scenario that you're thinking of, it's not that church, okay? (laughs) In fact, I don't even know the persons involved in this situation. I only know the pastor. I don't know exactly who was involved. But this pastor came to this church, a godly man, a man with a passion to reach out into the community. He began bringing in unsaved people, Some of them became converted, new converts full of passion for God. They would testify. They didn't know all the church language to use. Don't you love the testimony of a new convert? And the next thing you know, some of the pre-existing saints became a little uncomfortable with these new converts. And shock of shocks, that situation resulted in the pastor being voted out of that church. The reasons given, because these people don't reflect who we are as a holiness congregation, and we're concerned that we be viewed as a conservative church. I shudder. The Bible says if you lay a stumbling block in front of new believers, 
it would be better for you to have a millstone hung about your neck and be cast into the sea. Now, I am all for the promotion of conservative values. I hope you know me well enough to know that. I live this way because of who I am, what I believe, because of whom I serve, not because my church manual says this or that or the other. But friends, if we're so conservative that we can't handle a new convert who has not yet received light on various things, if we're more conservative or we're more concerned about our own name, our own reputation, than we are about the reputation of God, our priorities are seriously and frightfully askew. Amen. The tragedy of that situation is that many of those new converts were simply lost because they said, if that's what Christianity is, if you treat that pastor that way, I want no part of it. How tragic. These people didn't make the name of God hallowed. They sullied the name of God in the eyes of babes in Christ, and some of them may lose their souls. Friends, this is an awesome responsibility. We as Christians bear His name, and we can either make or break in the eyes of the world looking on the name of Christ. Are we holy? Are we magnifying the name of Christ? Have we allowed the Spirit of God to come in His purging, cleansing fire to fill us with the fullness of His Holy Spirit and to make us reflectors of Jesus Christ? I'm closing with this story concerning the name of God. I told you a couple of sessions ago about those dark moments after Jacinda was killed and how I couldn't seem to pray and the heavens were brass and Satan was battering me. And during that time, in fact, from the first moment that I realized that Jacinda had died up until God came and visited me down by the water for a space of about 20 hours, all I could do was say the name of Jesus over and over. I couldn't pray. I couldn't think. I couldn't put words together. I couldn't sense any presence. I couldn't find God anywhere. All I could do was say the name of Jesus under my breath over and over. I told you about that awful night and how I went into the living room and sat with dad while he was asleep in the recliner and dad woke up and he hugged me and he prayed with me, but it wasn't enough because he's an earthly father and there are limits to what an earthly father can do. I walked out the back door. I began walking down that dirt street. The panic was rising because I realized that if God didn't intervene, I was going to lose my mind. As I walked down that dirt street, I just said the name of Jesus over and over and finally I got down to the water and I was at the point of desperation and I looked up to heaven And I just said the name of Jesus, and that's when God spoke to me, and God said, Paul, why do you keep saying my name? And without even thinking, I just blurted out, because of all I know it represents, and because it's all I have. And God said, exactly. (laughs) God said, you know I'm the friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know that if you ask, you'll receive. If you knock, the door will be open. If you seek, you will find. You know that if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. You know that underneath are the everlasting arms of God. Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) Thank God for His holy name. No wonder Charles Wesley penned those words, Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. (laughs) 
My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Hallowed be thy name. What does his name mean to you? Just as importantly, what are you conveying to the world around you? Hallowed be thy name. Lord Jesus, thank you for your name and all that it represents. Thank you that at the name of Jesus, hell trembles and Satan must flee. Thank you that there's coming a day that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Lord, assist us to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Make us holy people. Make us people who spill over the overflow of the blessed Holy Spirit onto those around us. May we stand true in the midst of trials and adversity. And may we have a ringing testimony that will bridge the gap from their doubts to faith. For all that you do, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.